thanks so much for having me. Uh, this is, you know, I pre this, appreciate this invitation. Um, you know, I've, I've been your guest now several times, I think, in one capacity or another, and I so have a certain fondness uh, for this group. It's, uh, it's more and more of a powerhouse and better looking every time I come back, so I'm impressed by the audience. Um, the first time I came was with uh, Commissioner Kowalski, and he just really wanted, when I started, he really wanted to introduce me to this group. That was really important, and I understand why, and I'm, and I'm grateful. Um, I also, uh, Pete Orput, many of you probably remember and love Pete. Um, he, right at the beginning of COVID, he accepted a speaking engagement on sort of business issues with COVID. Well, he'd never been in, I mean, he was a prosecutor. What did he know? So he sent me, and of course, I'm a county, I mean, I just started to be a county attorney, but I'd been in private practice for 20 years. So the two didn't have anything to, to do with it. But so I reached back on 20 years of experience and talked about stuff that seemed to me to make sense about COVID. So we got through that. Uh, and then I think the, uh, we were here talking about with the, with the human, traf human Trafficking Task Force. Um, and I think that was, uh, that was a pretty good um, session, well attended. So I do, I do really appreciate this. And you know, over the years, I've gotten to work with a number of your officials. Uh, not too long ago, Mayor Zabel and Chief Newton and the others uh, had us over, to, the sheriff and I over to uh, the board for a board workshop on public safety. And some of this is kind of you know, inspired from that presentation, even though we didn't use a power um, point. I think I realized how many people just kind of want to know what's going on. Uh, and maybe less on a specific topic like, you know, identity theft or, or some of these others that are a lot of converse, uh, uh, presentations that I give. Um, but, you know, that, that synergy, that cooperation that the sheriff and I and Chief Newton and I and others um, and law enforcement generally in Washington County have with each other and with our office, you know, is really special. It's, believe it or not, not as common as it should be or as you would think. And I, and, I, and I really do appreciate the, the role that Chief Newton and I, for example, have, um, where call him on his cell phone, you can call me anytime. We know about what's, we know what's going on before most other people do, so we can prepare and, and work really well together. Um, um, so it's been a pleasure. And uh, again, thanks for having me. Um, a little bit quickly about myself. Um, so I grew up in, in Lake Elmo. Um, I'm living in the same home that I grew up in. Um, it was built in 1898, and my father sold it to me as is. It's held together by wallpaper and spackle, um, uh, and that's kind of my, my hobby, is keeping that thing standing. Uh, my wife, Lindsay, is a, uh, a lawyer for the, the state. She's a lot smarter than I am, but, um, and not as shy, um, so I think she'd probably be suited for public office. but. We also have a 12-year-old daughter and a four-year-old son, and um, she reminds me that a grown-up needs to be at home at occasion, you know. <laughs> In any case, um, I was going to pull. She did suggest that we have the timer. How much? So, what is it? 50 minutes and some questions, kind of. 20 minutes and 10 for questions. All right, good. Well, she, you know, my son, who's four, has got a lot of these four-year-old boy issues and one of the teachers said you know you might want to give him one of these timers so you can help with transitions and then my wife got me a timer and we <laughs> we haven't gotten one um, yet for him so I'm gonna to use it at her suggestion um, in any case so um, so I went to school here in, in Lake Elmo right so I live on just off of Klondike Avenue so right across from that and then uh, went to Minnehaha Academy in Minneapolis, uh, and then off to Chicago for college. Um, then I was in Germany in the Army stationed there after the first Gulf War. Um, and then I stayed in, in Germany and then in Belgium to, I was working on a PhD in philosophy of all things. Um, first in German, at a German university and then ultimately at a, a Dutch speaking university in, in uh, Northern Belgium. Um, but I started realizing I needed to find a profession that didn't involve me having a Santa suit or selling french fries or doing something like that and thought maybe, maybe I'd go to law school. Um, that's what you do when you don't know what to do with yourself as you go to law school. Um, so I went to law school here at the University of Minnesota and then went back to the university I was at in Belgium. And my first job was uh, at the European Commission doing antitrust enforcement regulation, which is 
a little bit different than what I'm doing now, but um, a different language. <laughs> but uh, it was a great experience. Ended up coming back to Minneapolis and spent 20 years in private practice doing complex business litigation, antitrust, securities fraud, that kind of stuff. I did a bunch of um, state constitutional work. I represented the, legislat the legislature against the governor during the line item veto controversy. I don't know how many of you remember that. Mark Dayton zeroed out the legislature so they couldn't keep their lights on because he didn't like the spending bill that he had signed. Um, and that was an interesting thing that you don't get to see every day. I did some work like that. Um, and then after 20 years, Pete Orput, who'd been a good friend for a long time, had been sort of bugging me to come to the county attorney's office. And, you know, I wasn't really ready to switch from the private sector to the public sector. Um, but Pete had a way of creating his own reality, and I was a part of that reality, and so there I was. <laughs> Pete just willed it to happen. <laughs> and those of you who know Pete, I think uh, probably have a pretty good sense um, for what I'm talking about. I know my good friend John Larson knows with CAST, right, what happens when Pete gets involved in your life. <laughs> um, phenomenal organization that, that we're working with uh, as well. Um, in any case, uh, then Pete uh, decided he was going to retire, and um, he talked my wife into um, allowing me to, to run for office. At the time, we had a, an infant, and she was trying to figure out what, what was good about being a widow for seven months with an infant, exactly. But he managed to convince her that it's the hardest job in the world, but in the end, and I thought, oh, there's no way she's going to agree. But he said, you can do more good in your community in this job than anything else he could think of. And of course, she had spent most of her career at legal aid, and that was the thing that, so she said, okay, you can run two conditions. One, this time we're not gonna wait till the very end like you do with everything else. You gotta like pace it, and no home projects. I was like, what, what, what? She said, no, you, you can tear out the kitchen floor in three days but it'll be six months before you get it back down, right? It'll be stacked, the wood will be stacked all over, and you know, she had a point. Um, so, I've been the county attorney now for, gosh, about two years. Um, I was appointed when Pete died. It was just terrible, because he thought he was gonna retire and was really looking forward to it, and then you know, found out he had cancer and died 10 days later. And it just, to this day, it just, just rocks me and gives me um, goosebumps when I, you know, I just, everybody loved him and missed him so much. Um, and I know everywhere I go, I see people that, that just still revere him and, and, and we miss him because he was a one in a kind individual. So I've been trying to follow in his footsteps. Um, and there's only one Pete Orput, so I've had to do things a little bit differently. Um, but, you know, he left a great, a great foundation. And um, um, there were some challenges during COVID. But he, um, you know, he left a great office to rebuild from, particularly the quality of the people. This is entitled just sort of the work we do. And what I want to do, and this presentation is probably um, designed to be a little bit longer. So there's a, you know, there's a kind of summary of the stuff that we're doing and maybe some discussion of some current event things. Um, and I definitely want to leave time for questions. Um, but there's also some people like, more of the how does a case, you know, I'm a bill on Capitol Hill, it's sort of the same idea, but for, for a criminal case, and I might blow through some of that, because I think most people are pretty familiar here with um, the charging process and the court process. Um, so yeah, well, I'm supposed to put that up when I do my invitation, my uh, introduction. So this is our um, criminal division. I should say we have 60 people in the office now, which is Pretty amazing because I think uh, since I started, you know, I've had several lawyers and, and a bunch of staff, and we're busier than, than ever. Um, that's just the world that we live in now. Um, but we've got about thirty, um, about thirty lawyers and about thirty staff generally, um, and we're, there's just a lot of exciting things um, that that are happening. One of the things we're doing is we're getting in the forefront of the digital evidence world. You know, there's just so much evidence now that is um, that comes into digital. You know, almost every ninety percent of the cases involve a hard drive, you know, it seems. And just think about it, almost everything has got at least one body cam. You know, often often the officers involved, and then officers that respond and 
former perimeter or do whatever, they all have body cams that have to be reviewed. They all, there's all squad cams. Um, there's a ton of uh, business surveillance and home surveillance that we end up getting. Um, now, you, you know, you saw what, what cell phone video can do. Um, and then, you know, that, that, that's before we even get to, if we get a subpoena for someone's phone, crack the phone, download all the data, sift through that. Uh, we've got subpoenas and things, warrants for um, um, social media, you know, from Facebook or Instagram or in a lot of in some of our um, sex trafficking cases, you know, from the, from the quote unquote dark web and some of those um, platforms that are there. So there's just a lot of evidence, digital evidence that we're dealing with. Um, and on, on one hand, it allows us to probably charge more crimes than we've ever been able to. You know, there used to be a time when it was a file with five or six documents in it and you just kind of did your best. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we can do now that folks haven't been able to do in the past, but it just takes a ton of time. It takes a ton of time for law enforcement to go through it and investigate it and refer it to us. And then it takes a lot of time for us to, us to go through it. So I'll just kind of do this overview real quickly. You know, the, we prosecute all felonies. We do some gross demeanors, uh, misdemeanors, and misdemeanors. And typically, the gross misdemeanors and misdemeanors are done by um, folks like Chief Newton and his team. You know, cities um, that have their own police department are doing those, and we're doing the felonies um, and some gross misdemeanors. And then in areas where the sheriff is the principal you know, law enforcement agency, they, uh, they refer all their cases to us. Um, and, you know, our, our purpose is to hold, you know, criminals accountable. You know, we do justice and protect public safety, sort of the, the, the mantra. Um, we're really involved in training and supporting law, law enforcement, and that's been a, a big deal after COVID, especially with so many hires. And it's one of the things that, that the lawyers in my office really like to do. They like the relationship they have with law enforcement. Law enforcement likes it because, you know, if a prosecutor doesn't like the way they did something, they can just say, well, I went to your class and I did it the way, <laughs> the way you told me to do it, and now you're telling me you're not gonna charge it. And that's, uh, that's good for accountability and it's good for um, those collaborative relationships that we have to have. Um, and then I'll talk about it a little bit later, but one of the biggest thing we do is, you know, we, uh, we support victims in this, in this process. And, you know, there's so many lives that are just um, irrevocably, you know, changed as a result of, you know, some, some terrible thing that, came, that happened out of the blue, you know, beyond their control and they have to spend the rest of their life trying to work their way through it. And, and so we have a um, um, staff of five with victim witness coordinators that work with victims and keep them apprised of what we're doing every step of the way and um, are also the ones who coordinate all the witnesses and get them ready, lined up and ready to testify at, at trial and that sort of thing. So they're a very key part of what we're doing. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the trends and I'm probably gonna skip around just a little bit because um, um, I'm mindful of the time, and um, I think you're probably most interested in some of the things that are going on, um, you know, in, in the work we're doing. Um, so we get, you know, these, a lot of these referrals um, have stayed um, steady um, from law enforcement, you know, since 2023. Um, but like I said, the cases are becoming more complex. Um, the, the property person crimes have decreased to, you know, the good news is to approximately where, where they were before COVID. Um, we're seeing at higher level drug, drug crimes though, and that's fentanyl. And the lower level drug crime increased. And, and a lot of that is that we've got more treatment focus, more diversion focus for, for, for drug users. We're not really interested in arresting an addict, but we really do want it, um, to, to, to try to find and, and, and charge the people who are um, involved in you know, commercial level drug um, distribution and, and that's a big target. So it's, that's one of the other reasons that you're seeing, you know, the high level drug crimes. Um, we have an increased focus on that. So here's a video. This is a problem that we have, right? It's crazy. The fleeing statistics have just skyrocketed as you can see. And I think I have to do this by so, I mean, we're looking at 34 in 2018, 2019, 45, you know, it's getting worse. And then bam, it started to skyrocket. 
So to the point where we had 110 in 2022 that we charged, right? Um, and it's, it's still high and we're on pace for another high year. And that is a huge problem. I'm sure that law enforcement will tell you all about that, but you know, something changed in our culture, you know, in 2022 roughly where, you know, the word kind of got out that maybe some of the um, you know, law enforcement were limited in their ability to pursue people. And, and there are best practices on when to let people drive through a residential neighborhood and just go wait for them to get home <laughs> um, and arrest them there rather than try to chase them down at 110 miles an hour like in what happened in Rochester, right? That's not the greatest plan. Um, but there, there is this culture of people who are just caught dead to rights. I don't know if they're feeling lucky or whatever. They just take off. And it's really, really dangerous. That's the part of it that, that just bothers me. And so we charge those um, you know, as, um, to, the, to the fullest degree that we can. And if, it, if there's any kind of assault involving an officer, we definitely want to charge that. Because that, that, that's, that's really important. And that's the, the biggest problem is that either they're gonna, there's going to be an accident, someone in the community is going to be injured, or the, um, the officers involved are going to be injured. So I'm going to we're kind of run through some of these things. But I, was, I think the. I, mean, I think this is the, one of the things that people are most interested in. So when, when we get a referral um, from law enforcement, you know, we've got 48 hours from booking until to, to, to we have to get a complaint out, 36 hours before we need to get that individual in front of, uh, of a judge for arraignment. So particularly on Monday morning, you know, the charging, so we've got one attorney who's on duty 24-7 to work with law enforcement for warrants or give them guidance in, in, in an investigation or anything like that, day or night, any time of day. Um, and then we rotate um, every day. There's a lawyer that handles the, the charging of the day. And the Mondays are tough, right? So people are looking on Sunday to check the, the, the jail calendar to see what's going to hit Monday morning. Um, so it's a bit of a scramble, which kind of leads to one of the, I think, the things that some people struggle with is that um, you know, we take what we have at that time, and sometimes we've only had a chance to look at a couple of body cam, you know, footage or maybe a squad, and you know, we might have, we'll have some officer reports typically and a little bit of other evidence, and you know, we've got to get a, a probable cause statement drafted and, and get that person um, charged. And so sometimes in the, in the newspaper, you'll hear about something that sounds pretty horrific, but the crime itself seems you know, maybe that doesn't reflect the crime. And sometimes that's because we know that we're gonna be amending the complaint and we're gonna be, you know, charging. Um, and, uh, you know, we would rather layer around the charges as we go than, than have to back off because we're, we overcharge the case. Um, so that's something to keep in mind when you're reading the newspaper. I'm gonna skip this part because it's actually pretty boring. <laughs> so these, so we have five of them now, but these gals are fantastic. I mean, this, these are the, the people that are, that have the hardest job because they're dealing with somebody who just lost, you know, their kid or, you know, or their house burned down, you know, in an arson or something. And, and they just, they just do a phenomenal job. Oh yeah. So that set the 15 minute mark. So I am going to chug along here. Um, you know, some of the juvenile stuff, I think we've seen a lot of, of interest in juvenile crime. I mean, it's really, I would say that the, the, the vast majority of the crime that we deal with actually is, is really just kids making a stupid bonehead decision and breaking the law when they do it, you know? And so what we want to do then, make sure they understand that they're going to be held accountable, but then try to get them into the right diversion program. Is, you know, a lot of the stuff you just, you don't want this on your record five years later or, you know, eight years later when you realize what a bonehead you were when you were in high school. And I know, you know, speaking for some folks, there's a lot of things that I never really didn't, I'm glad I didn't get caught, right? Um, so, so, but there, there's about 10 defendants that create a huge caseload for us because the, the level of the crime is, you know, is pretty significant. And, you know, I can tell you a little bit about, a I'll give you a couple examples of some of the stuff we have. 
You know, right now we just sentenced, uh, or we charged and, 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 and pled a 17-year-old. Um, he's one of our frequent flyers. And um, so in, in May in 2023 in Woodbury, officers see him using a cell phone. They pull him over. Um, they stick a piranha on it. So that's a, a, stick, a spiky strip on, you know, they put in front of the, wheel, the rear wheels in case he takes off. Of course, he does. You know, and then they end up um, um, arresting him after they caught him. And he had two firearms inside of the, the vehicle. Hennepin County resident. Um, and this case just turned out to be uh, an example of what's wrong with our system. You know, he'd been in charge in Hennepin and Ramsey countless times, you know, 20, 30 times. Um, some of, most of them pretty violent offenses. In one case, he hijacked, carjacked a, um, a car from a woman's driveway in, in Minneapolis with uh, two toddlers in the back and put a gun in her face and took the car. I mean, she was able to get the kids out at least before, you know, he, but that's, this is a 17 year old, probably 16 at the time actually. And so we certified him as an adult and um, the judge reversed it. I mean, refused to, 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 to grant certification, basically saying even though that he's done all these terrible things, you know, he does better when he gets into a you know, uh, structured treatment um, you know, program, a diversion or what they call EJJ, actually extended juvenile jurisdiction. It's a locked facility, but he gets you know some help, and then you know, the idea is that he's getting better. Well, I, I you know I give most people the benefit of the doubt, but at this point, looking at the record, um, I think you know there needs to be something that's that's um, a little bit more consequential than that. So we actually got that, that reversed, and um, he had 108 months of adult sentence hanging over his head in Hennepin County if we had gotten him certified. We were able to get him in adult jurisdiction. He's now going to be, um, you know, um, charged in a rain, you know, charged in in, um, in in Hennepin County for a fraction, and he's got that that time. He'll end up going to EJJ and not doing the adult time, but it's still there. But he'll be locked up in Red Wing for the next couple of years. Um, you know, we've got a couple more, but there's one that, that, that I'll mention here that um, I think is really indicative of the the balance that we need to have between you know, working with kids that have mental health and chemical, you know, addiction issues, um, and, you know, or you know, just have a real troubled background or whatever, you know, but there's some hope. And then some people that, you know, there's just no consequence in the system for a lot of these kids, particularly I think in, you know, in Hennepin or Ramsey County and some of the more um, progressive approaches. I think we're really progressive, but we try to balance that with public safety. So public safety is our first concern. Um, but here we had, a, we had a, um, an individual um, who was involved in 18 motor theft vehicles in 2021, right? He was 16 years old. So 18 by August of 2021. He had not spent a single night in detention during that. I mean, that's only 2021. I mean, you think about what 20 and 19 and 18 looked like, right? So um, we charged him and, and held him. And you know what? No more, more vehicle thefts, right? I mean, they, if, in a situation like that, if you're going to try to prevent that, I mean, detention is necessary. Um, and um, he, he ultimately was sentenced and, and was, um, you know, did the time and he should you know, be, it was EJJ, not certified as an adult, but um, you know, he spent two and a half years and you know, he'll be nearing the, the end of his EJJ sentence and we'll see what happens after that. But at least during that period, while he's hopefully getting some help, he's not out on the street. Um, I see that, you know, I, I, could, I probably need like three slides. It goes really quick, but um, I wanna make sure that there's time um, for questions, but before I do, the one thing I, I want to say, let me just see if, I don't know if we put this on here or not. Um, here, I was gonna show you this. So this is a stolen Kia, right? It's a 15 year old kid. Um, the squad's got him pinned in and um, he's running and so this, it's hard to see here, but this is the ignition, the steering column of a Kia. 
And there's a spot, and the chief probably knows better than I do because I can't quite see it from here, but there's a spot in here that, uh, that a USB um, pen fits perfectly in to, to complete the circuit and allow that cart to be started. And that's a, that's a lot of the vehicle thefts that, that we're seeing. Um, the good news is we didn't have a single carjack in Washington County in 2023 and none in 2024. Now, our, our, our vehicle theft, motor vehicle theft, is, you know, is, is, is high. It's coming down, but it's still higher than where we would like. Um, civil commitment, you know, is a big issue as mental health becomes more and more of a problem. And we spend a lot of time dealing with people who commit serious crimes, but then they end up getting evaluated to see if they're competent to spend, you know, to stand trial. And then, you know, if they are, whether or not they knew right from wrong when they did it. Um, and um, not all those, you know, not all those are successful for the defendant, but it's a huge part of, the, of our caseload now is going through these evaluations to determine whether or not we're, we're going to accept the, 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 the court's um, evaluator or we're going to hire our own and then decide, you know, we're going to try them. Um, you may have heard the Sadia Mohammed case, which is a woman who um, had, had serious mental health issues and she ended up um, murdering her, her, I think, seven-year-old daughter and had a four-year-old boy who had a, a lot of um, historic injuries that were consistent with child abuse and, and she had, we had to go through two different evaluators and she um, had a not guilty by reason of mental illness defense and we contested it and, um, and the court agreed and she ended up being charged um, with murder and getting like 26 years I think um, um, for, for that murder. Even though, I mean, she did have serious mental health problems but she knew right from wrong and you could tell by the way she responded in the investigation um, and by her, her mental health history that she had significant problems, but she knew that what she was doing was wrong. I will um, just get to the end here. Yeah, so we have a, 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 a quarterly newsletter called the Paladin Quarterly. It's pretty short. If you're interested in that, let me know. You can also sign up on our website. And I have some annual report for 2023 here. They're riveting, um, but actually, um, um, there is some interesting information in there if, if you're in, really interested in following the public safety issues in Washington County closely and see how your money is being spent. And, and those are here, you can also find it on our website. So with that, I bet there's some questions. There usually are. Somebody's gotta be curious about something. Yes? Here's the wrong question. What is the number one frustration in your position right now? Um, I'm going to take that drink of water here while I think about that one. Hmm? Yeah, go ahead. You can just close that and pull the plug. You know, um, I think um, something has changed in our society, and I feel like the boiling point for a lot of the folks that we deal with is way lower than it used to be. And you know, I talk to people, you know, for example, in um, wards and things and correction officers, and they talk about how it's just a bizarre phenomenon that there's a generation that comes in, they're not affiliated with any gang or anything, and they will throw down in the, in the lunch you know, room over almost nothing, even though the consequences are gonna be you know, solitary or whatever, uh, privilege is taken away. <laughs> It, they're just not thinking about the consequences. They're just not having that anticipatory reasoning process saying that if I do this, something really bad is going to happen to me. And I don't know why that is you know, exactly, but it is, I think, a, a big problem. And I think we don't just see it in juveniles. I think we're just seeing it in our, the level of our civil discourse. We're seeing it in the, in the level of crime. I think we see it, for example, in the, in the lack of respect for law officers, the assaults, the fleeing that we see. I mean, that is a newer, we've always had issues, but it's just gotten a lot worse. And um, that is one of the things that, that is, is really frustrating. I don't know if that's the thing that frustrates me the most, um, but, but it is a, it's a problem that we should all be concerned about. Yeah? Do you think it's related to like all the gaming? 
I mean, I'm thinking in a bigger, I don't mean, I don't do it, so I don't know, but it seems like in a lot of the games, you can really like run away from people, right? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I really, I'm not a, a social scientist or, you know, have a psychological background. I got to think it doesn't help. You know, I mean, I watched on the airplane the other day a movie called Beekeeper. Anybody hear that? It's with um, Jason Stram. And it started out like most of these formulaic movies, but during the movie, he's killing everybody on his one mission for justice. But including all the law enforcement people that are involved, and that didn't used to happen either, you know. And so, all of our action movies all involve somebody with a gun, and they're usually using that, taking a shortcut. Even the cop shows are doing. There's nothing in real life like that where you put a gun in somebody's head and ask them a question. But they're doing that in the movies. So I don't know, you know, how much of our sort of our violent entertainment industry has to do with it. But I think I can't help but think it's got to have something. If I could just add a little comment too, because yeah. our school district is in Washington County and Ramsey County, mm -hmm. so we obviously work with both counties. Mm -hmm. And I know um, I've been working a lot with John Choi's office in Ramsey County around truancy prevention. Yeah, we do a lot of truancy work yeah. too, as you know. And what we're knowing is that not only in our in our district, but statewide and nationally, kids are missing so much more school. And so we're trying to figure out. We we know that when kids are connected to school and positive role models. So the other thing we're working on is getting every kid connected to a club, a sport, an activity, a performing art. Because if they can have role models who are also focused on school and positive experiences, not only that, but we want to keep them busy between 3 o'clock and 6 p.m. because a lot of stuff goes down in those hours too. So just something that we're kind of working on, but I really think it's important that everyone in every industry across our, in the, in the um, chamber and everyone, to be really aware that this is such a need right now is to focus on going to school regularly is so important. I couldn't agree more. You know, our truancy program is really active and it is now a more of a service um, working with families approach rather than it used to be really punitive. And we very seldom actually need to petition the court for action truancy. The whole idea is to get the services and stuff available. And it's voluntary. The kids got to know that some in their families have to know that eventually there'll be unpleasant consequences but I mean the programs are now available so a lot of that kind of stuff and I couldn't agree with you more we saw during COVID sort of what happened I mean I had a so a nine-year-old at the time and it took three adults to get one nine-year-old to, to, to and even that was tough because she'd flop all the, all the floor and all the drama and everything we got grandma and me and mom everybody and can you imagine if you don't have that? You, you, you got a $700 iPhone and you're just running around on the streets. And we see so much of the residual effects of that. And it's, I think the biggest problem is exactly what you said. Because in many cases, school provided the only structure or at least a big part of the structure in that kid's life, whether it's a coach, an art teacher, counselor. You know, I mean, that might be the difference between them having some guidance and really you know, going back to an area where there's almost not. Um, I know you got a question, but I'm getting the, the gong here. So, you can talk about applause for Kevin Banks.